ruling coalition cements its majority in the Up House election Sunday, overshadowed by the shocking killing of the country's former leader Shinzo Abe. Stronger support for his party boosts the sitting Prime Minister's position until the next election in 2025. North Korea fires artillery shots Sunday, presumably from multiple rocket launchers, according to the South Korean military. The latest provocation came after six American stealth fighter jets arrived in the south to conduct joint ally drills. The first round of policy reports will be made by the new government to the top office. President Yoon suk yeol will start receiving reports from each ministry, beginning with the government's economic organ, amid various domestic and global challenges affecting livelihoods in the country. Good morning. Welcome to New Day at Arirang. We begin with the latest on Japan's upper house election that took place Sunday, just two days after the assassination of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. In a state of shock and grief, Japanese voters went to the ballot, handing a stronger majority for Abe's former Conservative Party and its coalition partner. Now this strengthens control over government affairs and key policies for the ruling party and incumbent Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. And here in Seoul, observers wonder what the future of Japanese politics means for bilateral ties between the two neighbouring countries. Our Kim Dami with the top story. Japan's ruling coalition secured a sweeping victory in Sunday's somber upper house election held in the shadow of the assassination of former Conservative PM Shinzo Abe. The former leaders of the Liberal Democratic Party took at least 76 out of 125 seats contested, securing its majority with its junior partner Komito in the 248-member chamber. While the upper house election does not signify a change of government, it does effectively show public sentiment on the sitting government. Such a strong showing helps a Prime Minister Fumio Kishida consolidate his role and drive his party's key policies forward, including the push to revise Japan's constitution. In terms of foreign affairs, hopes are high that frosty South Korea-Japan relations, held back by historical disputes, may get back on track. But some experts are not too hopeful that Kishida's firmer control of the government will be a game-changer for the bilateral ties. If, if he really, he already won. A lower house election last October. So if he, if, so if he really wanted to push ahead, um, taking concrete measures to improve ties, he could have done that already. But with the launch of the new Yoon Sagar administration, South Korea has taken one step closer to Tokyo by rolling out a new joint consultative body over compensation for forced wartime labor. Now could be an appropriate time for the Gishida government to respond to SARS efforts. Some experts say. In order for the UN administration to smoothly persuade victims or seek their understanding, I think Prime Minister Kishida also needs his own cooperative attitude or guidance. Hurdles do lie ahead for Kishida, who may be walking on eggshells around his conservative Liberal Democratic Party when it comes to historical conflicts between South Korea and Japan. However, in the aftermath of Abe's assassination, Kishida may now look to put his more conciliatory and mediating hue to the fore. And that might mean there could be room for high-level talks on the sidelines of a visit by a South Korean delegation to a memorial service for Abe this week. South Korea and Japan are reportedly on the final stages of arranging a visit to Tokyo by SARS top diplomat Park Jin Too, with South Korea's foreign ministry hopeful that the meeting can take place. Kim Dami, Arirang News. President Yoon suk yeol and key officials of South Korea will express their condolences over the death of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe at a memorial altar in Seoul. Now, the altar will be set up on Monday by the Japanese embassy in Seoul, and visitors will include Prime Minister Han dok su President Yoon's National Security Advisor Kim Song an and Foreign Minister Park Jin. Also, the Korean government plans to send a delegation to Japan for an official memorial service. The delegation to be led by Prime Minister Han and the Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, Chong Jin-seok. 
detailed schedule has not been decided yet because no date has been set for the formal memorial service in Japan. South Korean government ministries will start reporting their work to President Yoon suk yeol for the first time since the administration took office. The presidential office says that ministries will start reporting this week, with the Ministry of Economy and Finance going first on Monday. One of the main topics on the finance ministry's agenda is likely to be stabilising people's livelihoods amid the soaring consumer prices. The reports will be delivered at the Yongtan presidential office and, unlike in the past, the president is likely to hold one-on-one -on -one sessions with each minister for the sake of efficiency. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy and the Ministry of SMEs and Startups will be going next on Tuesday. The new US ambassador to South Korea arrived in Seoul on Sunday afternoon to finally fill a post that's been vacant since the start of the Biden administration a year and a half ago. The new ambassador is Philip Goldberg, a veteran diplomat who served in various roles, including as the coordinator for the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1874, which dealt with North Korea's nuclear tests. In his confirmation hearing at the US Senate earlier this year, he called for North Korea's comprehensive, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. North Korea appears to have fired shots from its multiple rocket launchers toward the West Sea on Sunday. This comes at a time when six American F-35A stealth fighters are in South Korea for joint military drills. SARS Joint Chiefs of Staff said Sunday that it had detected trails that suggested projectiles had been fired from North Korean multiple rocket launchers for 16 minutes from around 6.20 p.m. The North reportedly fired two shots according to an informed source. South Korea's National Security Office said it checked its military readiness shortly after the shots were detected and added it is closely monitoring the situation to be ready for any additional launches. At least 15 people were killed and two dozen more are feared trapped after Russian rockets struck an apartment block in eastern Ukraine. The attack comes as Moscow once again ramps up its assault on cities and towns in eastern Ukraine in an attempt to take control of the entire Donbass region. Kim hyo sun has more. Russian rockets have hit a five-story apartment block in Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region. Local authorities said the strike took place on Saturday evening in the town of Chesiu Yar. Residents recall the deadly moments. I spent the whole night in the street. I ran after the hit and stayed on the street. I thought it would hit again, and in the end, it hit three times. I couldn't stay inside. After the first hit, we ran through the corridor. During the second hit, we were running towards the door. We ran on glass shards. Then we ran to the basement as the third explosion happened. Following the attack, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's chief of staff said in a telegram post that the strike was, quote, another terrorist attack and that Moscow should be designated as a state sponsor of terrorism. Nevertheless, Russia, which says it's conducting a, quote, special military operation to demilitarize Ukraine, denies deliberately attacking civilians. Against this backdrop, a total of 347 Ukrainian children have been killed while over 600 others have been injured as of July 10th since the start of Moscow's full-scale invasion in February. That's according to data released by the Ukrainian Prosecutor General's office, which also emphasized that the figures are not final as efforts are ongoing to establish casualties in areas of active hostilities. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. It's time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deeper into some of the key issues in the spotlight right now. Last week, top diplomats of G20 nations got together in Bali, Indonesia for G20 ministerial meetings. The summit included official events and reception and also provided an opportunity for talks on the sidelines. With various global conflicts and challenges on the agenda, including the war in Ukraine, inflation and global food and energy shortages, what kind of progress was made between the ministers? Now for answers, we connect to Doug Bando, Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute. It's lovely to see you again, Doug. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be on. 
Well, first off, this meeting, of course, it was very much overshadowed by the war in Ukraine. And we also saw a rather dramatic walkout of the Russian foreign ministers, uh, foreign minister as Western countries slammed Moscow for its continued invasion of Ukraine. Now, did we see much multilateralism or cooperation at this meeting? I mean, what were your main takeaways? <coughs> Uh, no, the divisions were very significant. The agenda was set before the war. It did not include the war, but they couldn't get away from talking about it. Nevertheless, they were not going to get agreement from Russia, which was present, on anything in terms of the war. <clears throat> because of the divisions, you know, they didn't have a communique, they didn't have a joint photo. Diplomats were walking out on one another's talks. So the multilateral aspect uh, really provided very little solutions to the problems that they were supposed to address. Right, so very little solutions, but let's talk more on the war because it, the headlines say that Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, was largely isolated in the meetings. Um, what do you say with so many countries <coughs> still showing objection? Some, do we, are, the, are people going to see some tangible shifts from the war after this ministerial meeting? Uh, no, the <clears throat> countries in the Global South, including the hosts, uh, Indonesia, are definitely critical of the war. Nevertheless, they show very little interest in applying sanctions on Russia. And we have seen very little movement in countries to you know, stop buying Russian oil or to put other forms of pressure on Russia. So the division between uh, the, basically the United States, Europe, and uh, some of the important countries in Asia, and everyone else, is that uh, much of the global south is going to remain in a position where morally they believe the war is wrong, but practically they are not going to take steps or hurt their own people, and many of them are skeptical about the moral authority of the U.S. and of Europe. And well, there was also a great amount of attention on U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken sitting down with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi for talks on the sidelines, which they called candid. And the session actually lasted for more than five hours, which is quite hard to do even with your nearest and dearest. Well, do you see this as a positive signal for the two rival superpowers? Well, the willingness to talk uh, between the two governments is very important. Uh, the U.S.-Chinese relationship is very difficult at this stage. You know, these are issues that are not going to be resolved in one sit-down. Nevertheless, having top officials willing to discuss and frankly spending that much time talking does suggest an effort to make communication continue and also to look for areas where solutions can be found and progress can be made. Right. Now, South Korean Foreign Minister Park Jin was also there and had a trilateral meeting with Blinken and Japanese Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi. How do you view the current trilateral relationship as they tackle North Korea's recent provocations as well as trying to contain China in the Indo-Pacific region? Well, the trilateral relationship is very important, obviously. I think the major change is the new government in the Republic of Korea. President Yoon seems very interested in trying to find a solution. Uh, this is something which the Biden administration also wants very badly. So I think there are opportunities here to be able to bring these countries together with Japan and to try to find a way to solve some of these difficult historical issues and have greater cooperation. Obviously, it's in the interest of these great uh, democratic countries to work together given the threats that uh, are felt from both China and North Korea. Right. Uh, Mr. Ba Bando, thank you for your insights. We look forward to speaking to you again. You're welcome. Happy to be on. And that wraps up the first half of New Day at Arirang. But stick around. Coming up next in the second half, we have coverage of Japan's upper house election that took place Sunday, two days after the horrific, horrific killing of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. We discuss what's next for Japanese politics. Join us in a moment to find out in the second half of New Day at Arirang.
Korean South Korea's experience in tackling COVID-19 and introduced a Korean new The Korean survivor of Japan's wartime sex slavery met with... Extraordinary COVID. climate crisis and pledged to work with the EU to tackle the challenge. The objective of its North Korea policy is... Protest is gathering across the country to peacefully demand an end to hate and violence. Arigato. What matters? So good right now. Maybe I had a drink or two, but this somehow feels like it's forever. All my friends are here having fun and feeling good right now. Maybe this is forever. All my friends are here having fun and feeling good right now. Forever. Welcome back to New Day at Arirang. The Yoon song yeol administration is set to hold its first meeting with South Korea's Infectious Disease Crisis Responsory Advisory Committee to draw up response policies to tackle the latest COVID-19 spread. The virtual meeting is scheduled for Monday at 7 p.m. local time, and among the items on the agenda is the need to adjust quarantine requirements for COVID-19 patients, as well as response measures in preparation for a potential massive spike during the summer. The committee is composed of around 20 experts from health and socio-economic sectors. President Yoon has been stressing the need for science-based quarantine measures. South Korean diplomats in North America gathered to address anti-Asian hate crimes in a meeting held in Las Vegas. Hosted by Seoul's Foreign Ministry Friday, the deputy heads of South Korea's 10 consulates and embassies in the US and Canada discussed ways to tackle the issue. The ministry said Sunday that the meeting was hosted by Kim Wang Jun, who is the ministry's director general for overseas Koreans and consular affairs, accompanied by the head of the Korean American Coalition, a nonprofit group, the participants agreed on the need to prevent hate crimes against Asians by building a strong partnership between Korea's embassies and local law enforcement. The ministry's data show that there have been 279 hate crimes against Asian people in the US so far this year. Meanwhile, the Director General for Overseas Koreans plans to meet this coming week with the New York City Police Department to ask for their cooperation in stopping anti-Asian hate crimes and will hold meetings with Koreans living in the city as well. South Korea's new locally developed KF-21 taxied along grounds prior to its first flight scheduled for late July. This is the first time the fighter jet has moved on its own public eye. Peunji takes us to the scene. A fighter jet slowly leaves its hangar at Sacheon Airport in Gyeongsangnam-do province, located about 400 kilometers southeast of Seoul. This aircraft, developed by South Korea, is named the KF-21 and is now almost ready for its first flight. Ahead of its first test flight later this month, the KF-21 taxied across the runway at this production facility in South Korea. 
The homegrown jet is planned to complete its development phase by 2026. The aircraft also carried four medium-range air-to-air missiles underneath while taxiing. For the next four years, prototypes of the KF-21 will be put through around 2,200 test flights before manufacturing can begin. The country has almost completed building six prototypes, one of which was first unveiled in April last year. But this is the first time that the fighter jet has moved publicly using its own power. After testing the aircraft's stability and safety by having it taxied at low, medium and high speeds, we will be able to go through the final process for its first flight, and the jet will finally be able to take off and make its maiden flight. Developed and manufactured by Korea Aircraft Industries, or KAI, the KF-21 prototypes are still going through different types of ground tests at KAI's Aerospace Test Center. This included a test that makes sure the aircraft is capable of withstanding air load. A few days ago, the jet also successfully tested its engine, and a long blue flame was seen shooting out the back of the aircraft. Developing the KF-21 is a key part of South Korea's project that's aimed at replacing its fleet of aging F-4s and F-5s. The country set aside more than $14.2 billion for this project, aiming to produce a total of 120 KF-21s. Pae eun Arirang News, Sacheon. The selection process for this year's Hins Peters Awards is underway with applications open for the competition that honors video journalists who demonstrate extraordinary ordinary journalistic spirit. Named after German, ger, German journalist Jürgen Hins Peter, who covered the Gwangju pro democracy movement in 1980, the prize celebrates video journalists who follow his journalistic spirit and bravely log current events. It was due to Hans Peter's efforts that the world came to know the brutal massacre that took place in South Korea over 40 years ago. Among last year's winners were Belarusian journalist Mikhail Arshinsky, who covered political repression by incumbent president Alexander Lukashenko, and two anonymous journalists from Singapore who recorded police violence in Myanmar. Christophe Delors, head of Reporters Without Borders, will chair a judging panel that includes Arirang's own chief executive producer and director of TV production, Park kyung -shil. Applications will close on the 17th of this month and winners will be announced on September 6. For more information, visit hinspeterawards.com. It's time for Global Insight, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. Japan's ruling coalition, made up of the conservative Liberal Democratic Party and its junior partner, Komeito, cemented their vic majority in the upper house after voters cast their ballot Sunday. Now, this election, the election this year came two days after the assassination of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who stepped down two years ago but remained very much an influential figure in Japan's political circle. According to observers, his shocking death overshadowed Sunday's elections and polls show that his party, the LDP, and its smaller coalition partner were likely to see a boost in the race to fill the 125 seats up for grabs. While the upper house election is more symbolic than the lower house one, a stronger win does indicate support for the sitting parties. Now today we discuss the aftermath of Japan's elections and where the country's politics is headed with the loss of its longest serving leader whose legacy and influence will undoubtedly remain a fabric of Japan's modern politics. For this we are joined by Kozuke Takahashi, Tokyo correspondent of Jane's Defence Weekly and Jonathan Berkshire Miller, senior fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs. Very warm welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us. And well, my first question to you, Mr. Takahashi. Now, your country experienced the very tragic loss of your former leader two days before the upper house election on Friday. And well, it's still a time of just mourning for the citizens. And how is the nation processing this loss? Mm -hmm. You know, the Abe is Japan's longest serving prime minister. And it was very familiar scene of our daily life to see him on the news for quite a long time. But he suddenly died after being fatally shot. We Japanese still have uh, some empty feeling inside. Abe was known as a very nationalistic politician. He had a very tough stance against North Korea, especially over the issue of abduction issue. Uh, he had many scandals domestically, uh, such as the funding problem of the Cherry Blossom Party, 
but he was a prominent player on the global stage. In many ways, uh, he, he was a notable politician, a very rare Japanese, with, I think, uh, Suyong. Well, our condolences to the Japanese people. And well, Mr. Takahashi, now the death of the former prime minister, it was very much, it was very shocking for the nation. And punters say, observers say that it, uh, on the day of the elections, it boosted support for the ruling coalition. And well, do you think it really did affect Sunday's elections? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, So-called sympathy votes uh, surely boosted the LDP seat after the assassination of Shinzo Abe. According to TV Tokyo's opinion poll, 13% of TV viewers said they changed where to vote after the assassination of Abe, while 87% didn't change. But still 30% is a still big number, right, Sion? Exactly, still a huge number. And uh, Dr. Patrick Miller, now what did you make of Sunday's elections? What were your takeaways from the results? Well, thanks very much for having me on. And uh, I would uh, concur with uh, Takashi-san's uh, comments that this is a very shocking moment, uh, not just for Japan, but I think the region and globally. Uh, Abe Shinzo, I think, was a leader that will be remembered, uh, of course, in Japan, but I think more broadly uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific region uh, and beyond for some of his accomplishments. Um, as it relates to the election specifically, I would agree that there definitely was a bit of a bounce uh, as a, uh, a result of his unfortunate and tragic death. Uh, that being said, uh, the LDP only did pick up eight seats. I mean, that is something that is, is significant. Uh, it's, it's more than they had before, um, but it is only eight. And as far as a turnout difference, uh, there was only a difference of 3.2%. Uh, that being said, though, as uh, Takashi-san mentioned, uh, that 13 percent uh, that did change their mind uh, is is something significant uh, to note. Uh, Mr. Takashi, well, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, even after he stepped down from being PM, he continued to be a very powerful figure in Japanese politics. And what do you think his absence really means for factions within the Liberal Democratic Party? Mm -hmm. uh, Abe was a kingmaker even after he stepped down from uh, premiership two years ago, uh, he led the LDP's largest faction, uh, consisting of the 94 lawmakers. Meanwhile, Kishida's faction is uh, fourth largest faction, only with the 44 members. There is a high possibility that Abe faction will break up without Abe. Uh, he was a centripetal force uh, in, his, in his faction. I think Kishida will consolidate power without any kingmaker or any behind scene fixer from now on. So, yeah. And well, with the sweeping win, uh, the Prime Minister, Fumio Kishida, he's expected to have a rather smooth sailing uh, position until the next national election scheduled for 2025. And uh, Dr. Bertrand Miller, now, would this, well, many think that this would enable the Conservative bloc to push forward its, uh, their agenda for their push for more defence spending and also revisions to the country's pacifist constitution. So do you expect these kind of developments to take place now? Well, I think there's two different angles here. I think on defence spending and uh, the different defence legislation, that actually was, uh, you know, uh, these documents were planned to come out even before this upper house election. I think that will continue. Uh, there will be gradual increases on defense spending. As it relates to the Constitution, I think there's a, there's two sides to think about. Um, this election, I think, has solidified the super majority now uh, with the LDP, Komeito, and other parties that would potentially support constitutional revision. Uh, so that would bode in the right direction, I think, if you're thinking about constitutional revision. But on the second side, um, it is how much of a priority is this to uh, Kishida Fumio himself? Um, he has indicated that he does see uh, a need to have an urgent discussion on this in the Japanese diet. But how much of a priority? I think that is an open question. And how do you see this, Mr. Takashi, uh, whether or not to amend the constitution to include the self-defense forces in the constitution? That's emerged as a key issue for this election. So do you think it will continue to gain traction? Yes, I think so. Uh, this election was a kind of the uh, morning battle for LDP, and then constitutional changes, Abe's strong will. So many LDP members may want to change, achieve the uh, constitutional uh, reform. And then uh, in Japan, uh, 
there will be no any national elections in coming three three years. Uh, many political experts say this is the golden three years for LDP. So they can maybe do whatever they want to do. Uh, so I think the hawkish LDP groups, uh, such as Takaichi or Abe factions member, they want to push uh, this agenda. See you. And Dr. Park Shamila, now it seems that even on foreign policy, of course, mm -hmm. we can't uh, get away from Shinzo Abe's influence there. He was the first to promote the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific, which was then, of course, adopted by leaders of other countries, which, of course, evolved into greater cooperation in groupings like the Quad. Now, how did Mr. Abe shape Japan's foreign policy during his time? And how do you see Japan's foreign policy trajectory going forward? Well, I think Abe uh, Shinzo really was a transformational leader in many ways. I mean, I think there's the, the argument of how he changed uh, Japanese politics, um, but I think his impact on the region, on the Indo-Pacific region, um, you mentioned the free and open Indo-Pacific, um, but beyond, uh, frankly. Uh, one of the things that I find very interesting is looking at uh, Abe Shinzo's travels, for example. How many countries, uh, over 100 countries, he traveled to uh, during his tenure, which was very rare. Uh, and unique for a Japanese prime minister. So for him to sort of break the mold of what a Japanese leader is supposed to uh, do in a foreign affairs sense, I think was very significant. Um, and I think that legacy lives on uh, through, uh, through his successors, uh, Suga and now Kishida. And Mr. Takahashi, now, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, he was very international. He put Japan on, he made Japan very prominent on the global stage. And how do you see uh, new, uh, Prime Minister Kishida really uh, taking on this role? Do you see him in expanding cooperation with South Korea uh, beyond Japan's usual uh, Tokyo Washington relations? Mm -hmm. uh, Kishida is less hawkish than Abe. And then, so Kishida will be, uh, will take a consultatory approach toward South Korea, I'm sure. And then, uh, Kishida is not so sticking to the history issue. He is, he never want to change the Japanese history, et cetera. So, um, I think she, he will, how can I say, uh, promote the multinational diplomacy from now on, for sure. So I would like to thank our guest today, uh, Mr. Kosuke Takahashi, Tokyo correspondent of Jane's Defence Weekly, and Jonathan Bircher Miller, Senior Fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs. Thank you both so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Sun's out, guns out. Summer is high time to hit the beach. But before that, getting in swimsuit shape is crucial. That forces many to the gym to get their bodies toned for the beach. Our Shin ye went to find out why dieting has become the norm and what must be done to shed pounds the healthy way. It's summer, which means it's time to get into shape. Dieting has become the norm in South Korea. Studies show one out of two Koreans are always on a diet. I went to the streets to find out if this is true. Many of the people I talked to thought they were overweight, but South Korea has one of the lowest obesity rates in the OECD, even with a lower body mass index required to be classed as overweight. While countries like the US consider those with a BMI of 25 and up to be overweight, Korea classes being overweight as having a BMI of 23 or higher. I talked to a psychology professor to find out why so many Koreans are trying to lose weight. He said it's because of group mentality, especially in a homogenous country like Korea, where people inevitably compare themselves with one another. This has become more severe with more people active on social media. Everyone looks super skinny and beautiful on social media. They also happen to be smiling, which makes us subconsciously think that in order to be happy, we need to lose more weight. 
Also, users only get to know each other through pictures and videos. They inevitably have to judge people's personalities by their looks. So our mind thinks that the skinnier our social media friend is, the more diligent they are. Something appearing on social media for years now is a chart showing what's thought to be the ideal body weight for a particular height. You can see here, women who are 160 centimeters should supposedly be 47 kilograms, and a 180 centimeter tall man should supposedly weigh 66 kilos. But in reality, what's considered the average, the healthy weight is nearly 10 kilograms more than that. That's why health professionals stressed not everyone should be on a diet, and those who are trying to lose weight should be doing it for their own health. Here in Korea, people tend to think they are overweight when they are not. But medically speaking, dieting is recommended for people who are extremely overweight or obese. It shouldn't be solely for beauty purposes. It's to prevent illnesses and be healthy. As a psychologist, I can confidently say trying to eat less and going on a strict diet is very difficult and stressful. It goes against some of the nature. No wonder there's a concept known as comfort food. Humans are happy when they eat. If you're going to be stressed going on a diet, it's better not to do it at all. More importantly than having a perfect body is just having fun and being happy while exercising and eating healthily, like me right now. Shin News, Arirang News. These days, adding to people's concerns about inflation is a potential shortage of cooking oil. One of the world's main sources of it has banned exports of palm oil. And in Korea, this could lead to greater usage of alternatives like rapeseed oil, which is being produced locally. Our Cho Song Min has more. Rapeseeds are one of the most prevalent kinds of flowers that bloom in South Korea at this time of year. While they're mostly enjoyed as part of beautiful landscapes, one local company claims it's found a new way to use them in the kitchen. The factory produces up to 20 tons of cooking oil from the seeds each day. It's currently being used to cook lunches at local elementary schools, but will be on the shelves in supermarkets in July. Since homegrown rapeseed oil is now being produced, there's less of a price gap with canola oil. We're hoping to see a boost in consumption of local rapeseed oil. Containing omega-6 and 9 fatty acids, rapeseed oil is rich in antioxidants and can prevent aging and obesity. Compared to canola and olive oils, which are 100% imported, rapeseed oil contains less saturated fat and, according to experts, is better to cook with. Making salad dressing with rapeseed oil gives it much more flavor. It's also great for making stir-fried or pan-fried dishes. As rapeseed flowers can be planted alongside other crops on the same land, local farms can rake in more profits. We are researching ways to develop rapeseed species that contain high-quality oil and show high yields, and also to expand ways to harvest the flowers. South Korea's agriculture agencies hope to expand the culinary uses of rapeseed oil and secure a safe option to deal with a potential supply shortage of cooking oils. Cho Song Min, Arirang News. Now for a look at what news from around the world, we turn to our Matthew Ashley standing by at the Arirang Newsroom. Very good morning to you. Good morning to you guys. Let's start with South Africa, where shootings over the weekend at township bars have left at least 21 people dead. Well, that's right, Doyon. There have been at least three shootings in total, with the most recent one killing at least 15 people at a bar in Soweto. Now, local authorities said the incident occurred just after midnight on Sunday local time. They said a group of men armed with rifles and 9mm pistols started shooting, quote, randomly at the patrons of a bar in the Nomzamo shanty town near Johannesburg. Now, reports say that 23 people were shot and 12 died at scene, while at least three more died at hospital. Just a few hours earlier, on Saturday in Peter Maritzburg, some 500 kilometers away, another shooting left four dead and eight injured. And Friday, in Katlehong Township near Johannesburg, four people entered a bar and used a single gun, killing two people and injuring four. In all three shootings, the suspects fled the scene and are still at large. Officials believe the shootings are not linked, adding the number of gunmen in the first two incidents has not been determined, and the motives for all three shootings are still being investigated. 
Now, protesters in Sri Lanka have occupied the president's residence, his seaside office, and the prime minister's home. They have vowed to remain until the leader's resignations are official. The parliament speaker announced on Saturday that President Gotabaya Rajapaksa will step down on July 13th, but there has been no statement from the president himself. This comes as thousands of protesters gathered in the capital, Colombo, on Saturday. Sri Lanka has seen months of protests as it is suffering food, fuel and medicine shortages amid its worst economic crisis since gaining independence. Prime Minister Ranil Rikmasinghe also announced his resignation after his house was set alight during Saturday's protests. Protesters, however, remain skeptical about the leader's commitment to leave office. Now, Tesla CEO Elon Musk could be forced to see through his 44 billion US dollar takeover of Twitter or pay a 1 billion dollar penalty. This follows the billionaire's announcement on Friday that he is pulling the plug on the deal, citing his ongoing concerns over the number of Twitter spam bot accounts. Now, responding to the move, Twitter have reportedly assembled a legal team to sue Musk. Twitter's chairman Brett Taylor tweeted that the company intends to, quote, pursue legal action to enforce the merger agreement. Novak Djokovic once again managed to find success on Wimbledon turf, claiming his fourth straight men's singles title, Wimbledon title rather, and his 21st Grand Slam title overall. Now the Serbian tennis player beat Australian Nick Kyrgios on Sunday in the final match of the tournament. Kyrgios got off to a strong start, winning the first set before Djokovic fought his way back. Djokovic has previously won in 2018, 2019 and 2021, while the 2020 tournament was cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Meanwhile, in the women's singles final on Saturday, Elena Rybakina became the first player from Kazakhstan to win a Grand Slam title and the youngest to do so since 2011. She beat Tunisian Ons Jabur. Now, born in Moscow, Rybakina changed her citizenship in 2018 after receiving financial support from Kazakhstan. Her victory comes at a time where Russian nationals are banned from participating in many major sporting events, including Wimbledon. Good morning. Well, the new week starts on a rainy note again. Monsoon rain is falling at 15 millimeters an hour in Gangwon-do, Chungcheong, Nam-do, and Jeolla-do provinces, as well as Jeju Island this morning. In fact, Jeju is under a heavy rain advisory with more than 80 millimeters of rainfall expected. And the rest of the country could receive 5 to 60 millimeters today. Well, rain is forecast to fall after lunchtime in the capital before letting up in the late afternoon. While east of Gangwon-do and Jeju Island could see rain into tomorrow. Now, let's talk about the heat. Well, Seoul had the season's hottest temperatures yesterday at 35.1 degrees Celsius. And thankfully, much needed relief is on the way along with rainfall today. Now, the morning temperatures are similar to the same time yesterday in the mid-20s across Korea. So starting out at about 25 degrees Celsius. Then highs will be 2 to 5 degrees lower than yesterday. Seoul, Daejeon, Daegu, Chuncheon will be all getting up to 30 degrees Celsius this afternoon. In fact, we do have frequent rain in the forecast this week, so please keep an umbrella handy. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe.
Well, it looks like with the rain, the heat's going to let up quite a thankfully. bit. Are you looking forward to right. that? Yeah, thankfully. And um, well, we're in the studio, but our reporters are always out there trying to catch the scene. So yeah, exactly. Hopefully. Yeah, a lot of heat, a lot of sweating over the weekend. Yeah. So hopefully that will go away with the rain, but maybe not. The high temperatures are likely to subsist for quite some time. But well, that wraps up our newscast for this hour. We'll be back um, tomorrow, though, for our Tuesday's edition of New Day at Adirang. Thanks for joining us this morning and do stick around for more updates throughout the day. Have a great rest of your day wherever you are and always take care.